I am very grateful for the opportunity to talk to you guys tonight, uh, share a little bit of the Dharma. Um, and I've been a little, I've been a little torn about what to talk about tonight because it is the new year and I want to talk a little bit about uh, new beginnings and, uh, and how we celebrate the new year um, kind of across the, uh, the Buddhist traditions. Um, but the recent passing of Venerable Wanji is still weighing heavily on me and a lot of members of the Five Mountain Zen Order. Um, and yet there's a bit of a new beginning that is created with the passing of Venerable Wanji. Um, I don't know how many of you knew him. Um, obviously, uh, Venerable Unsan did, and, and I did. And I don't know how many of you have actually sat and talked with Wan Wanji and, and, and learned from him. Um, but he was a one-of-a-kind person who had a, a heart of gold um, and a little bit of the demeanor of a bulldog sometimes. And uh, so he'd come across, he would come across rough, and yet his heart was dedicated to the Dharma uh, and to making it accessible to people around the world, um, including all of us here. So I'm going to start off and I'm going to uh, read a little bit, relate a little bit uh, of a sutta called the Chunda Sutta um, from the Samyutta Nikaya in the Pali tradition, the Pali canon. I'm going to do that because it's about the death of Shariputra. And um, Shariputra was to the old uh, Sangha, the original Sangha, Shariputra was to that Sangha what Wanji Dharma is to us. Um, a man of wisdom and a guide, a teacher. Um, and there are a lot of similes and, and a lot of uh, similarities, I should say, um, in how people viewed Wanji and how people viewed Shariputra at his death. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of that, and then we'll talk a little bit about New Year's and how all these things uh, are a little bit of a archetype for new beginnings. So, in like I said, in the Samyutta Nikaya, uh, in the 47th chapter, the 13th sutra, um, is a sutta called the Chunda Sutta, or in English, with Chunda. And it goes like this. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Sawati in Jeddah's Grove, and Atapindika's monastery. At that time, Venerable Shariputra was staying in the Magadan lands near the little village of Nalaka, and he was sick, suffering, gravely ill. And the novice Chunda was his carer. And I take a little bit of a side here. Chunda was actually Shariputra's little brother. Um, and he was not a novice, but there were several Chundas in the greater uh, Sangha. And, um, and so... Throughout his lifetime, they called Shariputra's little brother the novice Chunda, even though he was a fully ordained monk. So anyway, I'll just give you that as a kind of a background. But it was his little brother Chunda who was taking care of him. And again, his little brother was probably, you know, my age in his 50s, um, because Shariputra was in his 80s when he passed away. So, so we go on. Then Venerable Shariputra, or in Pali, Sariputta, became fully extinguished because of that sickness. Then Chunda took Sariputta's bowl and robes and set forth and set out for Sawati. He went to see Venerable Ananda at the Jeddah's Grove and Atapindika's monastery, bowed and sat down to one side and said to him, Sir, Venerable Sariputta has become fully extinguished. This is his bowl and robe. Reverend Chunda, we should see that the Buddha, we should see the Buddha about this nature. Come, let us go to the Buddha and inform him about this. Yes, sir, replied Chunda. Then Ananda and Chunda went to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side, and said to him, Sir, this novice Chunda says that Venerable Sariputta has become fully extinguished. This is his bowl and robe. 
since I've heard this, my body feels like it's been drugged. I'm disoriented and the teachings don't spring to mind. Well, Ananda, when Sariputta became fully extinguished, did he take away your entire spectrum of ethical conduct, of immersion, of wisdom, of freedom, or of the knowledge and vision of freedom? No, sir, he did not. But Venerable Sariputta was my advisor and my counselor. He educated, encouraged, fired up, and inspired me. He never tired of teaching the Dhamma, and he supported his spiritual companions. I remember the nectar of the teaching, the riches of the teaching, the support of the teaching given by Venerable Sariputta. Ananda, did I not prepare for when this, for this when I explained that we must be parted and separated from all we hold dear and beloved? How could it be possibly, how could it possibly be so that what is born, created, conditioned, and liable to fall apart should not fall apart? That is not possible. Suppose there was a large tree standing with heartwood and the largest branch fell off. In the same way, in the great Sangha that stands with heartwood, Sariputta has become fully extinguished. How could it possibly be so that what was born, created, conditioned, and liable to fall apart should not fall apart? That is not possible. So, Ananda, live as your own island, your own refuge, with no other refuge. Let the teaching be your island and your refuge, with no other refuge. And how does a mendicant do this? It is when a mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of the body, keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. They meditate observing an aspect of feelings, mind, principles, keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. That's how a mendicant lives as their own island, their own refuge with no other refuge. That's how the teaching is their island and their refuge with no other refuge. Whether now or after I have passed, any who shall live as their own island, their own refuge, with no other refuge, with the teaching as their island and their refuge, with no other refuge, those mendicants of mine who want to train shall be among the best of the best. And those were the words of the Buddha in this. I really like this sutta and I find it so applicable to how many of us viewed um, Venerable Wanji. Um, and I'm not trying to eulogize him. It's not, it's not time for that yet. Um, but I want, I think this really, this sutta really talks about new beginnings, but it also talks about, um, you know, what Sariputta was to the, to the old Mahasangha and what Venerable Wanji was to us. And, you know, that's when Ananda, who was not fully enlightened at this time yet, um, but he said, you know, he was my friend. He was my teacher. He, he taught me the Dharma. He was wise. He gave me wisdom. Uh, I just, I can't even think straight, you know? But the Buddha compared that to a tree. He compared the Sangha to a tree. And the tree with heartwood, meaning the strong, healthy um, wood at the center of the tree. And the largest branch fell off. And in our case, that largest branch was Wanji. And there's no question about it. That's who he was to five mountains in. And yet the tree remains firm. Um, and I know that because, as all of you know, Venerable Unsan, and I think some of you know others, you know, um, Venerable Miyohi was who was here with us last week. Um, we have uh, Richard Sears, is, um, Joshu, I guess this is his Dharma name. Um, we, we have a lot of great teachers still in Five Mountains Inn, uh, and they continue on, and the heartwood is there. Um, and I think that's, a, uh, that's something that we all, as we learn and understand the Dharma, uh, we have to understand of all things being impermanent, and yet the Sangha can go on. Um, and so I, I find that new beginning with um, Five Mountains in really, you know, going on its own now without Wanji here as our guide and our, and our voice of wisdom. Um, there is something uh, paradoxical about the fact that this is the new year and we're moving forward now and we have to move forward without him. Um, in the... In the Pali tradition or in the Theravada tradition, uh, New Year is celebrated in different ways, usually throughout Buddhism, 
Uh, New Year's is celebrated um, according to the nation and how that nation views, views the new year. So in most traditions of Theravada, the new year is celebrated sometime in April at the April full moon. Um, in Tibet, it's celebrated in March at the March full moon. Um, a lot of the Eastern, um, Eastern Asian religions will celebrate both New Year's around the, around, I mean, the Eastern Asian uh, countries will celebrate New Year's both at the January 1st time frame and also at the Lunar New Year time frame, which varies sometime between uh, late January and mid to late February. Uh, so they kind of have two celebrations. Interestingly enough, these are all cultural to those countries. And it's not the New Year celebration that they celebrated at the time of the Buddha. Um, and so uh, I give you as an example that monks at the time of the Buddha did not say, I've been a monk for five years, I've been a monk for 20 years, or I've been a monk for you know however many years. They would count the seasons of the rainy seasons as to how many rainy seasons they had sat. Um, and so they would say, I've been a monk for five rains. The rainy season came at the same time every year. Um, but they counted their service. They counted their, their periods of, of uh, ordination as to how many rains they had sat through. And so I think there's something interesting about that rainy retreat and what we do now, even when we think about celebrating New Year's. Um, in a lot of the Mahayana traditions on New Year's, we will bathe the Buddha. Uh, we may have a we may have a statue. This is just a small one on my desk. If it will get out of my uh, oh, there we go. This is just a small one on my desk, um, but I have a larger one behind me. And on New Year's, we may bathe the Buddha um, as a as a renewal. Uh, but there's also a lot of meditation that we are expected to do. That we meditate on the New Year and we meditate. Um, on a number of things that will that we hope will lead to our uh, our liberation, our enlightenment, our awakening, um, and so I, I give just finally um, one other example of that uh, that a teaching of the Buddha, um, also from the Samyutta Nikaya, when the monks would go into retreat during the rainy season, this is what the Buddha would tell them. He would say, mendicants, meditate in retreat. A mendicant in retreat truly understands. What do they truly understand? They truly understand this is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering. Meditate in retreat. A mendicant in retreat truly understands. That's why you should practice meditation to understand this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, this is the cessation of suffering, this is the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering. So I encourage you, as we enter the new year here, make a commitment to yourself. If you don't have a daily meditation practice, try to establish one on New Year's. Try to meditate. Keep that daily meditation practice and meditate on the Four Noble Truths. That's how the Buddha teaches us liberation, and that's how we'll find it, through meditation. So thank you all, and may you all have a happy new year.